Thank you very much, Alexandra. So I'm Lizzie Craig Atkins. Um, I'm talking about a project that's collaborative with colleagues Jenny Crangle, Paul Barnwell, and Dawn Hadley, who's hiding over there. The curation of human skeletal remains was an important facet of medieval funerary practices. And the proliferation of charnel houses, that is, buildings associated with Christian ecclesiastical structures and complexes used for the storage of disarticulated human remains during the medieval period in Europe, is a, a sort of pan-continental um, phenomenon. Yet English charnel houses have received comparatively little scholarly attention in comparison with some of their continental counterparts, and this is arguably because very few actually survive intact. Almost all have long since been cleared of their human skeletal remains. The charnel house at Rothwell is one of only two sites in England at which skeletal remains still survive. And thus it provides us with a unique opportunity to explore the nature of charnel practice within an English context. This paper reports some of the key findings of the Rothwell Charnel Chapel project, which draws together new archaeological, architectural and documentary analysis to provide a detailed examination of this charnel house within the context of medieval funerary practices and beliefs. I'm going to conclude, if I have time, by considering how curation of human skeletal remains at Rothwell fits with later attitudes to the dead, and why this one site might have survived where others like it did not. So the Charnel House at Rothwell is a small subterranean room located beneath the southern aisle of Holy Trinity Church in Rothwell, Northamptonshire, which is the same place that Simon was talking about earlier, for those of you who don't know English geography. It's a rectangular structure, nine metres by four metres, made up of two equal-sized bays with a rib-vaulted ceiling. You enter via a low door in the eastern wall of the south porch, by a series of um, narrow, curving steps. The earliest descriptions of the charnel, which date to the mid-19th century, and some photographs, as shown here behind me, which probably date to the early 20th century, show the human remains were once stacked around the edges of the room. The lowermost layers are regularly arranged, with crania interspersed with long bones, and actually other skeletal remains were tucked in behind, so we're not looking at a right here, which is just crania and long bones, that's kind of what you can see, though, looking at it from the outside. Now, this layout accords very nicely with one excavated example of a medieval charnel house in England with in situ bones. This is St Peter's in Leicester. Here, the charnel room was demolished in the 16th century, leaving the bones in situ. So we have clear evidence of a medieval arrangement of charnel here at Leicester, which rather nicely accords with what we suspect the medieval arrangement at Rothwell originally was. So the charnel room at Rothwell houses the disarticulated remains of around 2,500 individuals. We weren't able to move the bones from their current position for analysis at the request of the church, who still take their curatorial duties very seriously and wish the remains to remain where they are. However, our assessment of an accessible sample suggests we're looking at the remains of men, women and children of all ages. The southern wall incorporates two large light wells, you can see on the far side, each placed centrally within the two bays. The window openings now are actually infilled, so it's all breeze blocked in and there's an air conditioning system in there trying to get rid of the damp in the room. And so the impression you get when you visit the site now, as we can see on the far side, is a damp, dark, gloomy room. This is clearly not how the Charnel Chapel was originally viewed. Light would have come in through those windows, and interestingly, as you can see from this photo taken in the 90s, when all the soil filling in those wells was cleared, you can see the bones quite clearly from the outside as well. The eastern wall, marked with the red square, <laughs> reveals the ephemeral traces of a wall painting, most likely medieval in date. This is incredibly poorly documented in the 18th and 19th century, when we suspect a bit more probably survived. People suggest it represents the resurrection, but they provide absolutely no evidence to support this. Apart from in 1912, a Mr. F. Bull visited and described, I quote, a small foot and the calf of a leg. We have not found the small foot nor the calf of the leg. What we have seen, however, is what you see at the top, two images showing a variety of black and red paint swathes on a sort of beige background. Enhancement of this image using RTI, a photographic technique that uses reflected light, gave us a little bit more detail, but what it mostly showed was how much of the plaster had simply fallen off the floor and was now crunched into the earth floor of the Charnel Chapel. So unfortunately, we don't get much further with that part of the story. The Charnel House itself can be dated with some security based on architectural features and stratigraphic relationships with the church above. 
The south wall of the charnel house lies directly below the southern wall of an aisle, which was originally a medieval chapel. They were probably constructed at the same time, and the aisle chapel is late 13th to 14th century date. So by association, so is the charnel chapel. Chronologies put forward for the date of the human remains, however, are much more problematic. Antiquarian writers, who had a good go at everything to do with the charnel house, associated the bones with a variety of mass mortality events. So we're talking the Black Death, the English Civil War. There's even some suggestions that they might be the remains of Saxons routed by Vikings. All these very dramatic explanations which you expect from 18th and 19th century authors. But of course, looking at the human remains, we can see that we're looking at a disarticulated bunch. We're looking at a group of remains that were almost certainly buried elsewhere within the churchyard before they were exhumed and moved to the charnel house. It's long been argued that the charnel chapel at Rothwell fell victim to the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. The change in religion from Catholic to Protestant resulted in many changes to church fabric and to changes on what actually went on within the church itself, including the loss of ancillary chapels and those associated with particular families. There were several examples of English charnel houses where we know they were cleared at or following the Reformation. At St Paul's Cathedral, for example, a grand example, John, Snow's, John Stowe, sorry, 1549 survey of London records that the year before, I quote, the bones of the dead couched up in the charnel under the chapel were conveyed thence from Finsbury Field and amounted to more than a thousand cartloads. So we've got a huge amount of skeletal material being removed from a medieval charnel site and reburied on waste ground, essentially. The buildings were then demolished. And at Rothwell, it's argued the charnel house was not cleared, but it was shut up in its entirety. It was simply forgotten then by local people. One of the first things we did to try and resolve some of these aspects of chronology was to undertake a small programme of radiocarbon dating on the human remains. We were hoping to refine some of these ambiguous aspects, but of course, radiocarbon dating is not necessarily going to help us work out when the bones were moved in to the charnel chapel. It tells us when the people lived. <coughs> Three crania provided dates within the 13th and 15th centuries. One of these medial crania is the only example that shows sharp force trauma. So we're not looking at a, a group of, of people who died violent death, but this one individual who apparently did is medieval in date. Two crania provided dates from the 18th and 19th centuries and could be as little as a century old. One of these we dated specifically because it showed evidence of anatomization. So we already had the slight hint that we we're probably not looking at someone of medieval date. However, one other individual was comparable in terms of their chronology. So that two of these five samples, albeit a very small sample size, provided such recent dates was rather unexpected for us. The previous assumption across the whole of England is that charnel practices ceased and these sites were cleared and simply not touched in the intervening centuries. The radiocarbon data also does a few jobs for us to bolster up some of our interpretations of the wider chronologies. It doesn't support any kind of single um, dramatic event being, the, um, being responsible for the deaths of these individuals. And it makes it seem very plausible that what we're looking at is a cross section of the population of Rothwell who derived from the, the cemetery nearby. The later edition of Human Remains is an original finding, something we weren't expected, and I will turn my attention back to that at the end of the paper, but for now I'm going to focus primarily on the medieval context of charneling. So primary documentary sources concerning the med medieval charnel houses in England are very scarce and heavily biased toward freestanding structures in cemeteries of high status ecclesiastical complexes, where bones could be stored either beneath the chapel or underneath the main church. These include foundation records and church wardens' accounts of the medieval period. For example, at Bury St Edmunds, which is the Latin, that's part of the quote I have in Latin up on the slide, the foundation charter of the 11th of September 1300 records the abbot's concerns at the disorderly state of the cemetery. His response is directions to provide for a chapel to be constructed in stone, under the cavity of which the buried bones may be laid up reverentially and properly in the future. So it seems here the chapel was constructed explicitly to deal with the situation of disturbed human remains, with the idea it could serve that purpose in future. Antiquarian records form some of the most plentiful sources for charnel chapels in England, however they are widely problematic. Not only are their interpretations sometimes rather outlandish, but we also have a few antiquarians who were honest enough to point out that they couldn't find evidence where they were looking. 
To take one example, Brown, writing about Hyde in Kent in 1697, records how, or by what means the bones were brought to this place, the townsmen are ignorant and can give no account. It seems genuinely the case that some of these sites were forgotten, even within a century of their supposed use. So to end, I'd like to reflect on how the evidence we've collated for Rothwell might aid a better interpretation of the significance of channeling in the medieval period in England. Many scholars within this framework take a very pragmatic approach to explaining charnel practice. There is a, a practical need for the storage of human remains, and therefore space was found to stack them up. And this was a sort of process that was conducted by sextons, essentially as a way of, of managing the cemetery space. But we think the archaeological and architectural evidence give us a bit more of an opportunity to illuminate the liturgical context of charnel how it might fit more broadly into practices within the church. Now, the obvious context for the late medieval construction of semi-subterranean rooms in which to, char to store charnel is the maturation during the middle of the 13th century of ideas surrounding purgatory. Most souls, having neither lived good enough life to go straight to heaven or bad enough life to go straight to hell, went to purgatory, where their souls were cleansed by fire and they could move on to heaven in time. Masses for these people offered by the living could offer essentially a bit of a boost to the souls into heaven and be counterbalanced by providing the living with a certain kind of getting rid of the debt they had and allowing their souls to pass through faster when they finally died. Alight to these beliefs about the fate of the soul are beliefs about the fate of the body. Because the body remained on earth to be reunited with the soul at the last judgment, the dead were in some way still present. If the dead were still so tangibly embodied in their remains, it follows the location of the bones with respect to liturgical architecture was significant. So if you look at this cutaway diagram showing the location of the charnel house at Rothwell, there's a few things that really rendered more compelling the liturgical significance of this space and what might have been going on. And I'll finish very briefly because I've had the stop sign as well. So you can see the charnel chapel is positioned underneath a medieval chapel at which the full accoutrements for the performance of mass were in place. Not only could the bones, semi-present in that charnel house, hear the mass and be associated with its presence, but by a little slot in the architecture up here, you have an actual direct communication between the two spaces. Mass could have been louder, but light could have shone down from the space in which these liturgical activities were taking place into the charnel chapel. There's a clear architectural link between the two here. I haven't got time to go on to talk a little bit about the, um, the ensuing centuries, but suffice it to say, Rothwell has survived for the reason of being just interesting. We have people coming on cycle tours in the 1930s to visit the site. We have many um, scientific articles, and we also have a rather interesting link with Tutankhamun, people stealing bones and then being afflicted by curses, having to bring them back. So, to draw everything together, I hope I've shown you how some new evidence drawn together from the Rothwell Channel Chapel project has enabled us to shed a little bit of a light on the more ambiguous aspects of the liturgical context of charnel practice in England, where, for the most part, it's believed that charnel houses served predominantly a practical process and did not carry on in use beyond the Reformation. Thank you very much. <laughs>